So the idea of the project that we're going to do today is we're going to take Martin here and all we're going to do is have him walk across to the axe, pick it up, that's it. Nice and easy, but the, the biggest difficulty here is trying to create a character's hand to actually grab hold of the object so that it's done in a convincing way rather than the prop just being plonked on top of the hand. So what we want to do is to create an effect like this. So to start with, to get him to walk across over there, really all we need to do is just apply a easy motion uh, just straight across. So we go to 2D motions. Uh, where are we? we? Go to 2D motions. Uh, all motions. Go to our walk cycles. This is my favorite pack, my cartoon human motions. I love this pack. And we'll have him start we just drag and drop the motion onto him have him start walking do the loop should only need the one and then end okay if we open up our timeline at the bottom all we need to do now is to match up his walking with the motion so we open up our character go to transform see our motion so we find the point that he's going to start walking, which is there. And we'll put a keyframe in there so that he'll hold position from there and then he'll start to walk. Now we know that he's going to start walking. Then we'll find the point that he's going to stop walking, which is there. Hit a V key there, or keyframe there. Now, so we know we want him to start walking there and end walking there. And all we need to do is use our transform to change his position across to where the axe is there now hopefully that should work straight away you'll walk straight across to the axe and hold in position now something interesting here that i want to do if we get out of camera mode and we zoom in on his feet you'll see because some characters have longer feet when he walks his feet will dip down below level now it's not too bad there but i still I'm still not a big fan but here you can see that his foot actually dips down below the grass level and underneath his foot there. We can use keyframing to bring that back up. The great thing about keyframing is that you can tweak every single little bone and pivot point in your animation. So if we open up our bones here, I'm just gonna change the color of it so that it's a little bit easier to see. And with the size, we'll reduce it down to 15 so it's a little bit easier to grab hold of. Now, all we need to do here is we'll start with this foot and we'll grab this bone here, I think, is the one that we're going to need, and it's going to give us it here, the L foot 2 bone. We need to just move forward to the point where it's going to bend wrong. So round about there, if we bend the foot, uh, bend it back like that, and on the L toe as well, we can just change the shape of the foot so that it will be back into the position that we actually want by tweaking it. There we go. Now, that's going to drop down there. We don't want that. We want, you just keep tweaking it around until such times as the bone's going to be where you want it to be. All right, here we go. So as it comes up, we take this bone. It's all just a matter of just tweaking these bones so that we're changing the shape of his foot to be closer to what we want uh, the, sh the shape of the foot to actually be. So if we bring that down and bring this one back up, here we go, right, and then put in a keyframe here for where it's going to start doing that again, and we can bend the shape of the foot to be closer to what we want so that it's not dipping down below ground level and if i hold down the alt key and slide my left mouse button i can move the frame around as well which is handy so let's have a look at that that's a little bit better on that foot already move it forward now you've got that bend in the shape of the foot Ooh, come back guys we've got the bend in the shape of that foot there like that so we'll just open the foot back up a little bit to make it a little bit flatter 
So all of this sort of stuff is, it's tedious, I know, but this is what's going to make the difference between your animation looking right and not looking right. Like just where, where you see a lot of people will just finish their animation and go, oh yeah, that's close enough. I tend not to do that. I'll sit there and just keep tweaking it and tweaking it and tweaking it until such times as you go, yep, that's where I want his foot to be. So as you can see, that foot already looks a little bit better the way it's going there. If we can just tweak the foot down and just keep bending all your bones around. There we go. I believe that's going to look a lot better. Right, like that. And then we can go back and you can do it with the other foot as well. Look, I'm not going to worry about doing the other foot at the moment because that's uh, it's exactly the same process. So I've shown you how to do that. That's the main thing. So the character is going to walk across here like that now. Now, what we need to do is I would, at this point, start getting his head to look around to match the fact that he's looking at the axe as he's walking over to it. Now, to do that, we need to go get, get out of our motions and open up our face tab. Open up our facial clip, and we've got our three timeline tracks of head, face, and eye. And the one that we want to work with to start with is the head track, because that is responsible for the rotation of the head. So if we open up our face key editor and our morph tab, we've got our head rotation gizmo here. All we need to do, we'll work out, we can start moving forward on the timeline and put in keyframes and make sure that his head is just starting to turn that little bit that he'll be able to be keeping his eye on the axe about every 10 frames roughly. He's just starting to move his head around to look at that axe as he's getting to it. There we go, move around. And move around to there. There we go. So now his head will start to just ever so slightly move around to look at the axe. Now all we need to do is to go back and select the eyes in our motion, key, in our fra uh, face key editor. Select the eyes. Then on about each one of those keyframes that we created for the head, we can change the position of the eyes slightly so that his eyes will also match up to looking at the axe. Now, it's only again, it's only going to be very, very subtle because his eyes aren't changing that much, but it's going to make a big difference to when he gets to that axe. Here we go. Because what we're trying to do is to just put in all those little nuanced movements that we do all the time. We're never holding still. This is what I'm finding when I animate now. We never actually hold still. We're always moving in some way. All right. So now, as he moves forward like that, now he's actually focusing on the axe as he moves over to it. So let's go through that. Now, I would add in a blink. He needs just a couple of blinks here because he's doing this stare. So if we open up, our sprite editor and go to the face and look for our eyes. As he's about to walk off, we'll put a blink in there, hold it for about four frames. One, two, three, four. Open it back up. Actually, let's do it on a more subtle. There we go. Let's do it on that. <clears throat> Instead of having his eyes so wide, let's do them on a more subtle. There we go. Right. So now he'll walk. He blinks. Now, as he stops and looks at the axe, we'll get him to blink once again. One, two, three, four. Open up the eyes. Right. So now, and, and again, you'll see that I scrub backwards and forwards through the animation constantly. I'm always doing it because every time you scrub back through it, you're going to find these little things where you go, oh, that's not looking quite right. That's the time to go back and make your changes and make your improvements on it. So as he comes forward, <clears throat> right, now we now the hard part, because what we need to do is to get him to bend down and pick up that axe. So to do that, as he pauses, what I would do, let's open up our 2D motion key editor, and I'm going to use the full body keyframe for this, because we're going to move his whole body in position. So as he comes through, at about there, I'll set a keyframe and open up our motion tab so we can see what we're doing. And that's going to put in a keyframe here on every single pivot point and bone in his body. 
And the reason that I do that is because I'm going to have him hold just a little bit before he bends down. So I'd put another one in there. That way, when he stops, he'll hold position. Then we can have him bend down. Now, from here. Oh, interesting. The reason his whole body moved. At this point here, at this keyframe, make sure his feet are locked to the ground. Make sure those two little locks are on. And that's going to lock his feet to the ground. So that now, when I have him bend, his feet will stay locked to the ground. Right. Here we go. So he's going to bend. Now we can just work out what position we want his body to go into as he's about to pick up the axe. And I'll stretch the bone so that I can take this part of his arm here and just have it extend over a little bit so he's going to reach over like that. Let's have a look. So he'll bend down and get ready to pick up. Now, rather than just go straight into that, I'm thinking at the halfway mark here, we can bring his arm up a little well, Hang on a second. Undo the stretch bone. At the halfway mark here, we can have him just bring the arm up just a little bit different so it doesn't go straight up into a perfect arc. Like a lot of our movements are not perfect. So usually when I do, when I go from one position to the next position, I'll block out those motions, but then in the halfway mark, I'll just make a slight change to it so that the arm isn't perfectly smooth because otherwise you end up with this robotic animatronic sort of look like, um, like a puppet at Disneyland that, just moves too smoothly so there we go so now he'll reach up and now he's going to reach down and grab that axe now as he does so we need to get him his hand onto the position of the axe where it's going to be <clears throat> pardon me and it's going to be around about there let's have a look beautiful now this is where it starts getting interesting because now we have to get that hand to actually grab hold of that axe and what I've done is, and I'll show you here in Coral Draw, what I've done is to create separate sprites for the hand grabbing the axe. And I'll show you a couple of different ways that you can do this. In Coral Draw, I've actually drawn the parts of the hand. Here we go. So I drew these individual sprites for the hand so that we've got his hand grabbing the axe while it's still in the ground and then pulling the axe out of the ground. I did that by creating sprites for this character of the hand that I can move all the different finger bones around so that I can change the position on the hand depending on what he's doing if, you, if I want him grabbing a particular item. Now, if you don't have that, there's still another way that you can do this. And I'll show you another way that you can do it. If you select the character and change his hand to be a hand that's gripping something. So we'll go to hold and we'll go to that like there. What we can do now is if I turn the background off, where's my background? Turn the background off and turn the axe off and in the character we'll turn his arm off so that it isolates just the hand. Right. Now, what I'll do is to export this hand as an image in the current frame at around about 3000 output. I'll export that as a PNG. There we go. Then in Photoshop, I'm going to open up this PNG. And I'll show you. Uh, PNG. Here we go. That's good. So there's our hand isolated. So if I crop that, so that we've just got the hand and then make the outside area around it a little bit bigger so I've got room to play. And move the hand over to here. If I bring the axe in and we'll bring, we'll export that. This is if you're working with, if I'm working with a PNG. You can export it easily as an SVG as well, but I'm just showing you a way that you can do it with PNG. So at the moment, all I'm doing is exporting this prop. Then I'll open that prop in here. Okay, there's my axe. Edit, copy. Oh, it's way too small. That's okay. We can reduce this down. So now all we need to do is to reduce the hand down to match the scale of the axe. 
Here we go. Now that I've got that, what you can do in your favorite drawing software is if I duplicate that hand and put it in front of the axe, all I need to do is to go through with your drawing software and delete the parts that you don't want. Right? And I'll just do that really rough here so that you can see what I'm doing. But if I get rid, and I'm not doing it perfect, normally I would go in and make sure that this is absolutely perfect. But if I get rid of the area like that, we'll export that as a PNG. And we can bring that into our project. Now we need to find it. There it is there. Now we can bring everything back into place where it was. So his right arm can come back in now. The axe can come back in now. And our background can come back in. Yeah. We'll just call this axe and hand. So this is just a way that you can create your own props of hands holding items and stuff like that. It's just, it's a handy way. Now, all you've got to do is to marry that up and then you just rescale everything to there. Let's, for the sake of this project, let's use this hand now. So in order to do that, what I'll need to do is to also cut off the base of the axe where it's in the ground. So we'll export that as PNG3 because we want two different versions of it, one in the ground and one when he pulls it out of the ground. You can make props that have got multiple sprites in them by bringing your sprite in, take it into composer mode. There we go. Then open up your sprite editor and in this empty panel here, we can load in our other sprite. So PNG3, there we go. So we now have two different sprites in here. We've got with the axe buried in the ground and the axe in full. So the other thing that I would do here is to change your pivot point on the axe so that it's there on the hand. That way, when his hand rotates, it's also going to rotate the axe properly. So if we hit edit pose so that we can change it, if we bring our pivot point down to the center of this crosshair, now when we rotate it, it's going to rotate around his wrist, which is what we want. Now, we'll just check and make sure that both of our sprites are in the same spot. Yep, that's perfect. So what we need to do is to make sure that this axe marries up pretty close to this picture. Let's take, let's work off the second sprite because it's the one that's buried in the ground. There we go. Let's marry this up pretty close to the other one. The closer you get it, the less you're going to have that little flick as the sprite swap over. Now that's pretty close in my opinion. So what we want to do now, we can turn that off just for now. At the start of the animation, we can turn that off because as he walks across to it, as he bends down to pick it up, and we'll change the, the layer order in a second, but as he bends down to pick it up, at around about that point there, now we want to swap that sprite to be the one with his hand grabbing hold of it, but in the ground. Now, you'll see that we haven't married up his arm to the hand yet. That's not a problem. Now, what we need to do is to work out the exact point that his wrist is going to grab hold of that axe and marry it up. So let's grab this bone, bring it out, bring it down to there. We want to try and just, again, get that hand as close as possible. There we go. Now, now we'll take the axe and we'll link it to his hand at this point. Link it to his hand. Then, at this point, we'll make his original hand invisible. So that now we've swapped from the hand to the axe. So we'll just play that animation through 
and you'll see that when he walks up, comes up to it, reaches down, and it looks like he grabs the axe, right? So there we go. Now, what we can do here is, if we take this motion out, right, there's the point where he grabs the axe. Now, you'll notice here that his hand goes in front of the axe. We want it, obviously, to go behind the axe. So all we need to do here is to change the z-axis value of the axe. If we grab the axe there, the axe has a z-axis value of 1. Martin has a z-axis value of 2, meaning he's in front of the axe. So we need the axe to have a z-axis value of at least 2.5. We'll make it 3, make life easy. So now, when he comes across, he reaches down, and now his hand goes behind the axe. So now we've got that nice, smooth motion. What we need to do now is to get him to stand back up. Okay, let's work out exactly where we want our camera. We want our camera to be about there. So he walks across to the axe, bends down. Now, what we need to do, once he's held it, to get him to stand back up. To do that, we're going to open, we're going to select Martin, and we're going to open up our 2D motion key editor, open the motion timeline. So that's where he's, he bends down and picks it up. Just hold for a couple of seconds, holding it. So we'll set a, a full body keyframe there so that as he, as he grabs it, he just holds for a second. Now we'll get him to stand back up. And to do that, you can either reposition him back up or you can hit the reset key and he'll stand up like that. And then all you need to do is just make a couple of slight adjustments on his foot there. So as he bends down, he'll reach up and grab, pick up the axe. Now, as he does that, I would tend to make the axe, give it that little bit of weight by turning his hand down that little bit, not too far, guys, a little bit like that, and move the hand to there, move the hand to there, the biggest problem that we have now is that the axe is in front of his legs, right? Now you're constantly playing around with your layer orders. That's okay. You can move things about as you need to do it. So as he picks up the axe there, that's fine. We can change the position of the axe now. We can change its z-axis value. If we take that z-axis value back to one, it doesn't change anything here. It still looks like his hand is holding it, but as he comes up, the axe will now go to the other side of his body. So he's going to stand up like that now. And that's what we want. So we're going to get him to turn around, come up, and stand up like that. Now, as he picks up the axe, what I want him to do is to turn around and look to camera. So as he bends down, picks it up, you'll see the axe here as the axe comes out of the ground, right? As it comes up, we need to change the sprite of the axe to be the complete axe now, like that. Now, interesting, it's a fraction below the level there, but it happens so fast that I don't think you'll even notice it. There we go, yeah, that's fine. So now he picks up the axe like that. So as he walks in, watching his face. Now, we're going to focus on the head rotation again. So to do that, we're going to open up his face we can close off the motion tab, open the facial clip, move to the head. This is the last point where we rotated his head. So again, around about every roughly 10 frames, I will move his head around so that you've just got that nice subtle motion in his head all the time. Moves around, he holds. Now, as he's going to bend down to pick up the axe, we need to make sure that his head is looking at that axe. He's looking at the point on the handle where he's going to pick it up. There we go. And then he's going to stand up. And as he stands up, we're going to bring his head back up. Like that. Bring his head back up. Now, we also want to do the same with the eyes. So on each of the keyframes, make the eye, select the eyes. There we go. They're okay there. Now, we get those eyes to start looking down at the axe. Here we go. Get him to, as he bends down, 
we want these eyes to be focused on the axe handle. Here we go. And hold there. And then as he stands back up, we'll bring the eyes back up. Great. Here we go. And move it around like that. Now, again, we need to add in the occasional blink. We've got a blink there. He stops and blinks. Now, just before he picks it up, as, as he's picking it up, as he moves away from the axe. So that point there, see when the axe swaps over from that sprite to that sprite? I would add in a blink at that point because that way we have something else happening on the screen that's going to distract our attention just that little bit from where the axe swap sprites two three four and it will just make it a little bit less obvious so now as he bends down he picks up the axe and then what we want to do is to get his face to turn to camera so we're going to get him he's going to stand up and i just want to get this nice subtle turn to camera so where's our face here it is our 360 head and make it a light, nice, slow turn. Then all of a sudden he's realized that there's somebody watching him. So you come up. And as he turns his head. Again, I would do the blink. As, he, as soon as he's going to... Any time a character is going to shift focus from one point to the other, I always put in a blink. And in a case like this where it's a slow head turn, I would do it for about six frames. One, two, three, four, five, six right and he's going to open up like that so he's going to turn and he's going to do that now what i want to do here i want to have the camera zoom in on his face right so he's walking through the woods on his own he's found the axe and all of a sudden he's picked it up and he's realized that there's somebody there watching him so let's go to our close off martin for a moment and we just want to work on the camera it's a great idea to keep your camera moving, not fast, not jerky, and not necessarily all the time, but use your camera as one of the actors in your scene, right? Treat the, treat the camera with the same sort of way that you would treat an actor. Keep it moving, keep it dynamic, right? So for instance, as he comes in at the start of the scene, I would do just a slow push in on this part here, just a little bit. Have a look, right? Just that little bit, so it keeps the it keeps the whole scene moving, stops everything from being static. And another thing, if you right click on your camera frame, hit transition curve. If you hit, if you select smooth, it will make that transition just a little bit smoother. Just an interesting point. Now, as he comes along and does that, now as he looks up to camera, here, I want the camera to zoom in on his face in several different jerky motions. So we'll go, uh, how fast do we want to do? We'll try it at 10 frames and see what happens. So we'll go into there. <clears throat> Is that fast enough? No, it's not fast enough. Try it at five frames. Here we go. Yep, okay. It's gonna go into five frames, hold for five frames, go in another five frames, and zoom in. So now it'll come in and go, bang bang like that and as he does that I want him to have a nice little smile on his face so we're going to blink and then smile so as it comes in bang bang I want him to blink you, you know what's funny when I animate you hear me say things like bang bang and zoom and all this I'm I'm working a rhythm in my head while I'm animating and I do that with my own little sound effect catalog in my head that that really helps me find that rhythm of animating so Let's have him blink just for the four frames. One, two, three, four. And then as he opens up his eyes, I want him to smile. But the, the smile that I want to put on his face, because he's so close to camera, I need it to be really smooth. I don't want to just do a sprite swap from flat to smile. So what I would do as he blinks, just before he opens his eyes, we'll go to deform. On the mouth, we need to go open up our face tab 
we need to open up in face motion we need to select the mouth and that's going to bring up the four timeline tracks for the mouth transform sprite deform and opacity what we want to use is the deform track i'm going to put a keyframe at that point there and then i'm just going to have him do a nice little smile by just a little grim by deforming the shape of the mouth there so that it's very very subtle so as he comes up and looks at the camera he just gets that nice little smirk on his face right so he comes in like that now on that last shot when it can when the camera comes in on that last shot there i've added in one last thing on my scene and that is what's called dark blur when i turn that on i've just put all it is is just a, a faded circle around the outside that just sort of um gives that darkness that focus it's like a spotlight that focuses on his face so where is it where it comes in that's the exact moment that it comes in so we'll have it there right so it just adds that little bit of emphasis to it so that when he op when he looks bang comes in and zooms in like that now the last couple of things that we need to do our animation is pretty much done obviously you can go and add all your sound effects and that in post-production but there are just a couple of other tweaks that we can make here that are going to make the difference number one we need to make sure that his shadow follows him i've just put a little uh oval uh it's just a solid black oval uh, like this there it is there it's just a solid black oval that i use as my shadows for things and then i leave the opacity at 25 percent i find it works really well you can go to a lot of trouble in post-production with after effects and hit film and things like that to create very accurate shadows for me this little oval works fine and all i need to do is to make sure that that oval follows martin as he walks so if we go to the transform tab of our shadow when he starts to let's let's just make sure that it's directly underneath him there we go as he starts to move right from there put a keyframe in and then as he walks across to here once he gets to the point where he's going to stop all we need to do is to move that across to there and by rights that should now follow along with him now how specific you want to be here is up to you and i and as i the more i've been animating lately i have been really specific with this and by that i mean the shape and scale of the shadow you'll find that as he as he moves in as he stretches out like that you can change the shape of the shadow right so as he comes back in make it a little bit smaller and again what's going to happen it's just keeping it constantly moving and therefore making it dynamic and making it less flat and again just moving that around about every 10 frames or so is really all you need to do to get the effect that you want we will just expand that out and then as he comes in on the last one here on the last keyframe here goes to there so now that's going to move along with him right the other one is the shadow for the axe because with this we want to just affect the opacity because as he bends over and picks up the axe as he lifts it up from about there what i would do is to have the shadow disappear and go to zero change the opacity to zero so through these frames here we're going to go from opacity of 25 down to zero that way when he picks up the axe by losing the shadow like that okay it just the shadow doesn't need to be there anymore because it's not on the ground here's a great tip always save your projects as you go along you never know whether something might happen that your computer might fail the software might fail you might change your mind on something always save in stages and what i do is whenever i make an important change to the animation or if I've been working on something that took a really long time to get right, I'll save it as a separate project, right? Like I'm working on a project at the moment and I've got nearly 20 saves of one shot because I want to make sure that I can go back through time and go back and change things as I need it if I want to. 
So we're going to have a look now at his hand gestures. A really good tip I can give you is always do your hand gestures as the very last part of your animation. Now, the reason that I do that is because I do find sometimes if you do it earlier on, uh, when you set a keyframe for the hand gesture, if you change your keyframes around, Cartoon Animator can alter the hand gesture back to the default setting and it can get really frustrating. So I do it at the very end. If we go to motion and we open up our 2D motion key editor, here are our selections of hands. I'm going to make sure I select the right hand, select the right hand, here it is, select the right hand because that's the one we're going to work on first. Now, we work out the hand gesture that we want and we'll just have it as natural. There we go. Down here on our timeline, we have these keyframes. When I do hand gestures, what I do is to just move forward because you'll find when I move forward to this keyframe here, it's going to reset to the original default hand gesture. So if I move forward, see, it, it resets to the default. So I just select the hand gesture that I want. When I go to the next frame, it's going to do the same. It's going to reset. So I'll just put it in. And I'm just changing. Here we go. Open up his hand a little bit there. I'm just changing the hand gestures that I want for the character. Have him swinging along. And you can add in more like that if you want to. But generally, I will just stay with the gestures that are there. Here we go. That gesture. That gesture. Also, I tend not to use the same gesture too often in a row. I like to move the hands because again, when you're just standing there, your hands, your fingers are constantly moving. Okay, come to there. Now, when he reaches down, I can leave it there like that. When he reaches down for the axe, here we go. He's going to reach. So I would do something like that or like that one even. Open it right up. He's going to reach down for the axe. So as he, as he comes down, we'll go to the, we'll go open his fingers up like that. There we go. And he grabs it. Now that's all we need to worry about with the right hand because after that, it's the prop of the axe that we see, not the hand. So let's just go through and make sure that that works. Yep, right. So, we need to make sure that that axe is in the right spot. Let's change the axe now to be in front of his head at that point. And make sure it's in front there. There we go, that's better. Right, so now he reaches over and grabs the axe like that. Now, all we need to do to finish our souls off now is the other hand. So same thing, open up your hand gestures. Now always make sure that you select the hand that you're going to apply to. By default, it's set at both hands. Just use the hand that you want. We're gonna use the left hand. Make sure the left hand is selected. There it is there. And we're going to put it into a natural position again. And if we hit flip hand, you can flip it so that his palm is inside. All right, so as you can see, his hand is palm in. You can have, if we, with his hand open like that, select the left hand, select the left hand. You can have his hands so that they, in the natural position like that, you can have them palm in or palm out. So however you want to have it is entirely up to you. If we open up our keyframes, now, the same thing, we're just going to follow along on the keyframes that are existing there. So, we'll just stay with that. Flip it. Stay with that. Flip it. Move across to there. Now, I have his hand open up a little bit. Here we go. Caress. Flip the hand. And we go back to here. Flip the hand. There we go. Flip the hand. And you can, as I said, you can check. It doesn't have to be the same gesture that you go to all the time. Sometimes it's nice to actually have the hands change because that way the fingers will flex as he's doing stuff, which looks good. 
tardaban en el editar there, get a relax to that point there. Now, have him now interestingly, it might be nice here if he actually flexes his hands together so that when he comes when he stops, he flexes his hand together. Now we're gonna try and that hand's not flipped over. For some reason that hand flipped over. So this is why I do hands last, because it, you get this constant flicking of the hand gestures going the wrong directions and stuff and it drives me crazy. You don't want to be mucking around with this many keyframes in the middle of an animation. You want to make sure that you do this at the very end. Okay, so there. So there. Uh, have it open up. There. Close up. I didn't flip them, did I? <laughs> Don't forget to flip your hands as you do them. Flip the hand. That one. Flip the hand. And then finally, go back to there and flip the hand. And so that should be the end of our animation. So let's just watch it through one time. So as he comes across, bends down picks it up and you get that nice little smile at the end. So that hopefully has given you some indication on how you can get a character to interact with a prop. You can get a lot more realistic interaction by spending the time to create your own sprites of hands holding objects and things like that because you don't want to just have the prop flat on top of the, the figure. It doesn't work. So I hope this information has been valuable to you. I will see you for the next one.